God. Don't look afraid. How did he get out? Don't be afraid. <laughs> this is no. a dream. Like, the last dream you may ever have. <laughs> For nightmares <laughs> are coming. There's a world online that houses some of the strangest and most obscure abominations, all collected into one single hub. These wonders are withheld from the public with the intention to prevent mass panic and to allow society to continue functioning as usual. Failure to contain them could bring catastrophic consequences that could end worlds or even universes within this expanded franchise. They're contained by one single foundation, and documents are kept on a website used to classify and identify these aforementioned creatures. Considering the nature of the channel, it's surprising that it hasn't been discussed. So today, we're going to cover the world of the SCP Foundation. But I'm mainly going to be talking about the game. SCP is an extremely expansive franchise of stories, writers and more that will probably keep us all here all day. And I'm sure you guys probably won't be able to keep your patience for that long. From its roots in 4chan to the wildly expansive wiki, with many entries gaining notoriety on the internet and adaptations of the source material that really showcase just how detailed and interesting SCP is, we're going to cover all the cool stuff for this Halloween special and your viewing pleasure. But before we get into any of the games and extended media that adapted the work of the foundation and caused it to blow up like nothing the community's ever Ever seen before, some context is needed to get you into the SCP universe. Now I know there's a couple of videos out already which are lengthy and cover everything to do with the SCP franchise and I love them so much, lovely guys, I love the videos and all but I don't give a fuck! So with the help of Nexpo, we're going to dive into the world of SCP. Damn right we are. The roots of SCP can be traced all the way back to 2007 on the export of 4chan. Nowadays, the board's a far cry from its former self, but at the time, X had a very good reputation overall, being a place that contained threads that would actually freak you out. Creepypastas were a relatively new concept back then, accompanying green text threads that would undoubtedly keep you up at night. With that being said, one post would be the spark that would set off something unheard of in the horror genre. On June 22nd of 2007, a post was made to the X board. It was a creepypasta, with the title, From the Files of Site-19. The post in question describes an item known as SCP-173, and within it, details are given about the special containment procedures used to ensure the safety of anyone in its general vicinity, as well as the following description. SCP-173 is constructed from concrete and rebar, and was once painted with Krylon brand spray paint. While SCP-173 is animate and malevolent, possessing a desire to kill anyone in sight, it does have a weakness, being that it can't move while being watched. Despite this, it's still highly dangerous, having the ability to move at least two meters in the literal blink of an eye. According to an archive, its chosen method of annihilation involves snapping your neck at the base of your skull, either that or strangulation depends on whether it's had its coffee that day. The original thread in which the post was made can still be viewed utilizing archives. From this, you're able to see the effect it had on people immediately after it was posted. On one hand, some saw this as a reference to the third season episode of Doctor Who, Blink, in which the protagonists have to escape concrete statues that remain stationary when you look at them. Others were more inclined to comment on the lackluster spelling and grammar in the story. But, a lot of Anon saw something special about it. It was written as a casual lab report. No narratives, no beginning, no middle, and no end. Just a report on a terrifying creature that can and will end your life in the blink of an eye. This meant that there could have been more creatures like this out there if this format was anything to go by. Interestingly, one post on that same thread stated that X should, quote, get together and work on making this a huge story with lots of shit to make the rest of the internet shit bricks. And so, X got together to start working on new entries and reposts of 173 to add to the small but growing catalog of SCPs. Jumping ahead, in January of 2008, 
SCP began to increase in popularity once again, and this led to the creation of multiple other threads on the topic. Within these, five of them were created between January 17th and January 19th. These five would then become the basis to what was, at the time, known as the SCP series, with SCPs such as 682 being created and, to this day, remaining a staple of the community. But there was a problem. 4chan, you know, being 4chan, started to get tired of the constant barrage of threads about SCP and were kicking up several fusses about it, which eventually led to the 19th of January 2008 when one guy grew tired of it all and created what would be known as the SCP Wiki, in its earliest possible iteration, using a wiki farm called Edit This. Pretty much a carbon copy of Wikipedia. At this, all the entries were moved over to this wiki, and these entries were the ones that were made and curated on X and B. Instead of writing directly to these boards anonymously, writers decided to write their scary stories directly to the SCP wiki, and their creation served as the foundations of the SCP universe. Writers such as Kane Pathos Crow, Fritz Willy, and Dr. Gears. As Nexpo said before, SCP-682 was created from the flurry of new SCPs being posted to 4chan. The original iteration of 682 was pretty much an English language language GCSE paper that probably got a C-. There was no sign of the interview log that many of the posts to the SCP wiki are now widely known for, and the description was like a synopsis to a film on IMDb that probably wouldn't see the light of day for about four years. Luckily, a writer on the edit this wiki decided to do his job and edit this piece of shit to make it a little bit more interesting. Now there was a major problem with edit this. The client was pretty much like someone trying to make a copy of The Witcher on scratch and having to play it because there's literally nothing else you could play it on. In other words, it was extremely unpolished and buggy and it was extremely hard to communicate with other budding writers in the SCP circle. For example, Eberstrom, who is described as one of the most influential members of the old edit this wiki, but has since been pretty much sent to the can to rot in silence as if he didn't exist. Over the next six months of the existence of edit this, we'd begin to see the number of posts increase to the hundreds from less than a dozen. There were some caveats though. SCP-001 was not to be created. Many well-respected writers within the SCP community elected to submit proposals as to what SCP-001 could be, but to this day, it remains reserved until someone's able to make an entry worthy of being called the first. Many suggestions made by various writers have since been deleted, but there are some survivors of this and they can still be read to this day. During the days of Edit This, people began to see more popular stories emerge from the SCP files, one of which being Josie the Half Cats, which became popular enough to warrant new branding for the SCP franchise, resulting in the first logo of SCP being based on her. With all of this being said, you may or may not be wondering how SCP went from the slums on edit this to the massive cul-de-sac that is the site today. Well, one major problem with early SCP was that there was absolutely no quality control. It's pretty much like Steam nowadays. You could write whatever the hell you want, whenever the hell you wanted. There weren't any guidelines whatsoever. You wanted to make a creature that turns your hair inside out? Well, get your notepad open, it's writing time! The only form of help when it came to writing SCPs was the guide expertly titled How to Write an SCP. The problem with that was that it was all the way at the bottom of the site and it was an optional read, so you didn't need to heed the warnings set out by the article, you could post wingdings and still get your SCP on the site. Because of all of this, the early SCP wiki was showered with some terrible, terrible entries. The kind of stuff that you'd find on Wattpad when you sort by the most recent. And they kept it! They kept some of the trash that was on the site because there was no way to delete it without a fight. You made a terrible typo in your masterpiece of an SCP. Well, too bloody bad! You're going to have to live with it for the rest of your life. All this being said, however, the first bits of actual canon started to surface in the early days of SCP, with many terms that are used a lot nowadays making their first appearances here. So for the benefit of you guys looking to do a little bit of reading, I'll go through some of the vocab used a lot to describe SCP. Currently, there are thousands of SCPs you could read and all of them have a form of classification, which basically tells you how safe or risky the phenomena is. The safest classification for an SCP is simply named SAFE. It basically does what it says on the tin. It's a a safe SCP, but not in the way you think it is, since this is SCP, and nothing is ever truly safe. All this means is that the anomaly in itself can be contained by simply leaving it alone. There doesn't need to be any special containment procedures put in place to contain the anomaly and prevent it from doing any damage. A safe object can be completely world ending if it's not contained properly though. The classification is just letting you know that it's easy to contain the anomaly. For example, SCP-261 is just a vending machine with a keypad, but what does this vending machine do? Event items, you 
DOTS! But not just any item. Actually, it does dispense any item, just as long as you pay for it. If you use it too much, however, it will start dispensing weirder and weirder items while still food, you probably don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole, it's kinda grim. Not to be confused with the other vending machine, SCP-294, which can dispense a cup of anything, including a cup of nuclear fission, which would certainly result in... There's Euclid, which is just a little bit more risky than safe. This essentially means that the anomaly in question is unpredictable. You don't really know what to expect with it, or it requires a bit more effort than a safe class object to be contained. If you leave it alone, it could do nothing and just stay there menacingly, or it could find out where you live and blow your entire house up. The choice is yours. An example of this would be me, SCP-426, who's an ordinary toaster that can toast bread when supplied with electricity. But if I'm mentioned by any other person, they have to refer to me in the first person. I'm class classified as Euclid and despite all attempts to find a way to do it, it's literally impossible to refer to me in the third person through speech or through writing. If any of you are in my presence for over two months, you'd begin to identify yourselves as a toaster. One unlucky family member tried to eat an electric socket to try and be me, and you could probably guess how it turned out. <coughs> Funnily enough, SCP-173 is classified as Euclid. <laughs> as if it would be classified as safe in the first place, since it's fairly easy to keep SCP-173 contained. 173 is described to be kept in a locked container at all times, with no fewer than three people entering it at any given time, and the door has to be relocked behind them when they enter. Two out of three people have to maintain eye contact with SCP-173 until everyone has vacated and locked the chamber again. Failure to maintain eye contact would result in death. <laughs> A routine checkup on SCP-173 going wrong is the main setup for the game based on this wiki, SCP Containment Breach, but we're going to get to that later in the video. The final main classification of SCPs is Keter, 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 pronounce it however you want. If safe and Euclid classes are anything to go by, then this specific class is downright impossible to contain. Well, not really, but it's very bloody difficult to contain these SCPs, as they require a huge amount of resources or extremely complex containment procedures in order to keep everyone safe. We're talking government-sanctioned drone strikes just to get that damn teddy bear to get into the containment chamber. Keter class SCPs tend to be the ones that pose the biggest threat to humanity, the world, or the entire structure of the universe as we know it. Die. And it's all in the hands of one foundation. An example of this would be SCP-106. It's an old rotten man, and I'm not talking about your English literature teacher. This old man can wait for days at a time waiting for prey and can cause corrosion in any and every sort of solid matter it touches. SCP-106 will attack humans within the age of 10 to 25 like the old black nonce he is and will attack them by damaging major organs or tendons. Then it will pull the disabled prey into its own pocket dimension, which is essentially a world where he is in complete and utter total control. And the worst part is that it's very difficult to evade him as he can walk through walls and ceilings. Oh. As such, it's extremely difficult to contain him, as the wiki has three revisions to the special containment procedures required to contain him. The latest revision has SCP-106 contained in a sealed container comprised of lead-lined steel. With 40 more layers, no one is allowed within 60 meters of 106 as well, not even staff, so you can kind of tell that they're really not joking around with 106. Despite this, SCP-106 is not necessarily a world-ending threat like some of the other SCPs classified as Keter but we'll get into those a little later. So to clarify, safe means it's easy to contain, Euclid means it's slightly more difficult, okay. and Keter means, oh my god, someone call the army! Those are the basic and most important forms of classification for each of the SCPs. There are other classifications that are used, but they're used rarely, such as Thaumiel, which is a class used for SCPs with the intention of counteracting other SCPs. And there's Neutralized, which is an SCP that just stopped working, or maybe it's been destroyed perhaps, but one thing's for sure, it's not an anomaly anymore. So now you know a fair bit about how the SCPs are classified, let's go back to the past. Back in the days of Edit This, the scientific nature of SCP began to take shape. Previously, as additions to the series were made, people began to make more random articles with less science in them, disregarding the entire point of the SCP Foundation. The Foundation was rooted in fiction, but it still needed a sense of realism so that people who are into the franchise can be immersed into the universe that's provided for them. You can't just classify an SCP and say it's a pie that measures approximately 3.14159265 cm, and if you ate it, your brain explodes from the amount of numbers you have stored in it. This in turn would lead to a post made by a user who went by the name of Aiden stating that Would anyone really object to me going through these over the course of the next week or two and truncuating the overly precise measurements? There are quite a few SCPs that say stuff like approximately 57.2354545 centimeters. There's no need to go down to nanometers when you're writing an executive summary. It could probably even be reduced to a single significant digit. In most cases, I'll probably run it off to tenths or hundredths of a unit, if not whole units. 
I'll also be converting all measurements to SI, because that's what you use in a research report. Miles, pounds, etc. may be included in parentheses if really necessary. This started to signal the beginning of the end for Edit This, and it wasn't because of this reason in particular. With any sort of project that starts out early, you'll always get an extremely unpolished database of text. SCP was no different, with formatting being weird and pop culture references being shoved in every article like an MCU film. Edit This was never going to be a viable home for the SCP series, as the host of the service was forcing many of its own subscribers to pay up or be yeeted from the internet forever. The SCP series had no way to pay their way out, and deletion was pretty much a certainty. This was until Fritz Willy moved the entire SCP series to a new service, Wikidot, where it still remains to this day. Prior to writing this video, I did say I won't go into detail about the infighting and the politics that goes on in the SCP community. And believe me, there is a lot. So we're going to do a bit of a time skip. In 2008, after much debate within the community, the SCP series was officially canonized as the SCP Foundation. With the logo that we are all extremely familiar with coming into existence in October of 2009. Over the next three years, various features were slowly added to the SCP wiki leading into the first thousand SCPs being created by October the 11th 2011. These SCPs are dubbed as Series 1 and as of writing this video we are 5 series in which is a testament to how far SCP has come since the early days. Things all came to a head in 2012 however as two major events would cause a major shift in the SCP community. On January 19th 2012 a video was uploaded to YouTube titled SCP-087 by a user named Haversane. In this 11 minute clip, it shows the first person perspective of a player walking down a set of never ending stairs. This is based on the actual SCP-087 which is located on the campus of <laughs> A side note, in the SCP universe, the foundation likes to keep a lot of data secret for security reasons. So in the case that you're binging some SCP content, you may come across these three terms in text. Essentially, this adds an extra level of eeriness to stories that otherwise wouldn't be if all the details were laid out in front of you. Anyway, SCP-087 is an unlit staircase that's seemingly never-ending, and any attempts to light the area are ineffective because light sources brighter than 75 watts are simply absorbed by this enigma. The game was released to a lot of public interest and was made just for fun. It can still be downloaded, but it's extremely bare bones. The floors are all randomly generated, so every playthrough will be different. This actually inspired Jonas Rakonin, also known as Regalis, to create a game based on the same SCP, but instead of a staircase, it's a never-ending corridor. This was named SCP-087-B and was released on January 30th, 2012. This game played on your burning fear of something watching you, whether from behind or in front, and this prompted warranted fear of the various events that you'd encounter that would undoubtedly freak you out. Upon completion of the game, it'll crash the window that you're playing it on and display one of four messages showing that your in-game death is inevitable. The sheer success of SCP-087-B had eventually led to the development of the biggest game that the community will ever see. SCP Containment Breach is a game by Regalis, developed shortly after SCP-087-B and using the same engine as that game. While the engine might be seen as dated now and there, efforts being made to remake the game in a stronger and more recent engine, this game served as a strong adaptation of the foundation and its source material. If the original X-Post is the spark, then SCP Containment Breach is the nuclear bomb. On April the 15th, 2012, SCP Containment Breach was released and it was released to overwhelming success and popularity, with people touting the game at the time as one of the scariest games ever made. 
played, which I wholeheartedly do not blame them for, not one bit. The success of the game was unprecedented in the SCP community, with submissions changing from 50 a month to 50 in a single day. Early SCP was pretty much a jump scare fest featuring SCP-173, and over several years it has grown into a game filled with lots of different SCPs you could have the pleasure or displeasure of encountering. In the game, you play as D9341. No, you're not a bot, don't worry! In the SCP Foundation mythos, there are other classes involved around the place. These are known as D-Class Personnel. Essentially, these people are lab rats, and in this universe, they kind of showcase the more shady side of the Foundation. Since they need new people to test SCPs in containment on, they call on the D-Class who act as lab rats, and as such are extremely expendable, as these people are often recruited from death row or the prison population. In Containment Breach, you play as one of these D-Class Personnel, off to begin a routine test on SCP-173. In later updates to the game, the game will begin with a cutscene in which you wake up and soldiers will escort you to the testing facility that 173 resides in, providing more context into the way that the foundation works. In the first few updates of the game, however, this wasn't a thing and you just spawned in directly behind two other D-Class personnel as you begin testing. However, of course something goes wrong! The entire facility malfunctions and this frees 173, inadvertently causing a major site-wide containment breach! So now you're in danger and you have only one goal, survive and escape the facility and maybe explore some of it along the way, all while being chased by several SCPs that have escaped containment. The game's extremely creepy as the environment you're shoved in by the end of the cutscene is one of silence and paranoia. The only thing you hear mainly are your own footsteps and your breathing, which would in turn lead to major jump scares with the appearance of 173, the intercom going off, and random screams and alarms going off around the place. Oh. SCP Containment Breach has you, the player, navigate a series of randomly generated rooms which are divided up into three zones. The Light Containment Zone, which is full of SCPs that aren't seeking you out and actively trying to kill you, the heavy containment zone which is the direct opposite and is filled to the brim with risky SCPs that could snuff you out at any time, and the entrance zone. With how expansive the SCP mythos is, you're probably shitting yourself because you have absolutely no idea what's in store for you, if you're unaware of what the SCPs are. And this leads to an extremely useful feature that the game has over other horror games and even other main games in general. It doesn't beat you over the head with stupid tutorials that interrupt you every time you play to tell you that this monster could kill you by snapping your neck! As a D-Class, you are normal given a sheet that formally describes the SCP you're about to be tested with. This happens in the beginning of the game in which a soldier will give you a note about information concerning SCP-173. This is an effective and in-character way of feeding you information as this is something you'd receive on a normal day, as opposed to a note scribbled in Wingding saying something cryptid in upside down Zalgo text. These sheets are littered across the facility and you could add them to your limited inventory with the intention of reading them later. If you choose not to read them then it's pretty much your fault that you'd end up getting killed by any of the SCPs in question, because you probably thought that's a cute bear and now their ears going around you. Another bit of paranoia fuel is added with the main gimmick and mechanic of SCP Containment Breach, the blink meter. The blink bar on the HUD is only really used with relation to SCP-173, as its gimmick is to move when you're not looking at it, which includes the act of blinking. When the blink meter completely depletes, the player will automatically blink for a quarter of a second, unless it's done manually with the space key. The blink bar will also deplete faster through various means like going through gas without a gas mask for example. This will become a major problem if 173 is in the vicinity as a neck snap probably isn't ideal. In order to progress through the game and escape the facility, you need to acquire key cards around the place that will allow you to access areas that D-Class personnel are probably not allowed to access. There are different level key cards that you're able to collect and there's an SCP that gives you the opportunity to rank your key card up, but don't try to be smart and max out the key card or else it could just troll you. Since the game is limited graphically... There isn't much that can be shown directly in terms of SCPs and the effects that they have on you as a player, so an effective way of counteracting that from the developer was to describe what's happening to you, with small text in the middle of the screen and very well done sound design that really made you feel as if your ears are going all over your body, or your femur is about to be broken. That being said, there was an issue of some sound effects just sounding the same, but that's something that could be easily overlooked with the amount of tension that's in the game. If the player encounters a threat that doesn't kill them right away, they will bleed as well. Only first aid kits or equivalents will stop the blood loss but players have to be careful just in case they're being chased, as an injury would mean they move a lot slower than normal. SCPs-106 and 173 are constantly after the player throughout the game, with the former sending you to its pocket dimension, complete with some visual jump scares should you get caught, and the latter always knowing where you are on the map at every time, requiring you to be constantly vigilant and blinking before you open doors and shutting the door behind you, you know, common etiquette. SCP is on the only thing you need to evade when it comes down to it, as the Foundation also sends nine-tailed fox operatives to the site, with their main goal being to recontain any escaped SCPs and kill any rogue class Ds they encounter. 
which incidentally includes you. So now you also have to be stealthy in order to survive. Since the game is randomly generated, there's not much else to describe about the main plot of the game after the initial breach, owing to the fact that everything could be different on each playthrough. But another reason why the game has the reputation that it has for being extremely creepy is the variety of monsters and anomalies that you could encounter at any time. You can encounter an anomaly that doesn't want his face to be seen, and if it has been noticed then he will give you 20 seconds to 1 minute to run away as fast as you possibly can. But it wouldn't matter because he will catch catch you. Always. You can encounter an anomaly that's just a piece of paper written in blood. Only problem is that if you get too close to it, you'd have an intense urge to finish it with your own blood. You can encounter another anomaly that wishes to heal you, but if it touches you at all, you instantly die and reanimate temporarily before eventually being gunned down by an NTF operative. There's such a vast variety of SCPs to encounter, and the game allows you to do this on your own with no guidance as there isn't any linear plot. All you gotta do is escape the facility alive. Not even pausing the game is safe, because at any moment that you pause the game, there's a small percentage of a chance that the game will unpause itself saying that you can't escape, which isn't really ideal if you're being chased by SCP-106. There are four endings to the game that are discoverable upon reaching a specific gate, and I'll provide a link in the description to a video describing all four for you, because it's a lot to take in and explain in one simple video. That being said, the effect of SCP Containment Breach was absolutely unheard of in the SCP community, and it signalled a newfound interest in everything SCP. Since the engine is a little dated, efforts are being made to remaster the game in the Unity engine, promising the same game but with more modern graphics and more SCPs to discover, generating a lot of its own funding on Patreon where people can pledge to see potential updates for the game. The success and the interest in SCP also led to a multiplayer game being created called SCP Secret Lab, based on the popular Gary's Mod game mode called Breach, released in 2017, in which different factions are in a facility with different agendas. The Class Ds must escape from the facilities, whereas the SCPs have a free hand in going on killing sprees with their abilities. All the while, the nine-tailed fox operatives must maintain order in the facility as they attempt to neutralise the Class Ds and rescue the scientists. Naturally, it's an hilarious, creepy and fast-paced bloodbath that also provided hours of entertainment on YouTube and Twitch. With all of this being said, it can be safely argued that SCP is an extremely immersive and diverse universe full of different anomalies and phenomena, starting from its humble roots on 4chan over a decade ago and becoming an effective basis for creative games, films and animations, providing something for literally everyone interested in the world of horror. There's so much to explore in the franchise and I urge everyone watching this video to just go straight in and read all the SCPs that the Foundation has to offer on the site. Thank you guys for watching this brief look into the SCP franchise, and thank you to Nexpo for lending his voice and aesthetic for a lot of the video. Go subscribe to him if you want more of a horror fix. This is a topic that so many people were asking me for and I promised a while back. All the sources and links to the comprehensive history of the franchise can be found in the description, as well as some links to some extra SCP reading if you want to get into the franchise and feel like this video wasn't enough to satiate your hunger for some good horror. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. We're really close to hitting 100k and I really want to try and hit it before December. If you want early access to new content, behind the scenes, scripts and extra gifts from my discord, why not pledge to my patreon? Thanks to Angie, Dag, Toby, Admiral Vape, the man with three first names, Bailey, Francis and Dakota Lewis for pledging to my patreon with the ascended pledge, and I'll see you guys in the next video.